I'm at a Lego convention with my grandson, and we're looking at Lego displays, and all of a sudden these folks come running up and saying, oh, it's him, it's him, it's the guy from Buffalo Trace. Can we take a picture? Come over here. And my grandson says, Papa, this is not any good. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's episode 258 of Bourbon Pursuit, and as usual, we always start the show with what's happening in the world of bourbon. So, here's your bourbon headlines this week. Major news is that Brown Foreman has announced that it has reached an agreement to sell Early Times, Canadian Mist, and Collingwood Brands, and the Canadian Mist production assets to Sazerac. We're big fans of Early Times Bottled and Bond here on the podcast, so it'll be interesting to see what will happen with this brand because we had crowned it our 2019 Bottled and Bond Champion. We'll discuss this on a future roundtable, but it's likely a good move between all parties, where Brown Foreman can focus on its core brands, and Sazerac gets to own another piece of history and figure out how to position it in the market, along with all the other brands it has acquired. The sale of these brands is expected to close later this summer. As Confederate monuments start coming down across the nation, there's a new chapter beginning in our country. But while we're moving a statue of Confederate President Jefferson Davis from the state capitol in Kentucky, workers discovered inside the base of the statue a bottle of Glenmore Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey and a copy of the State Journal newspaper dated October 20th, 1936, which was the day the statue was erected. Unfortunately, the bottle was empty. Many distilleries are looking to be more green and Whistlepig's Distillery is situated on a 500-acre former dairy farm in Shoreham, Vermont. The company enlisted Same Son of Vermont for its solar project, where they used 173 in-phase IQ7X microinverters across the distillery's warehouse building and bottling plant. Now, I'm reading this like I have any idea what a microinverter actually does, but the array features a unique solar skin module wrap that can showcase the whistle pig name that is superimposed on a row of whiskey barrels and you can see it from the sky. According to Jeff Kozak, the CEO of Whistle Pig, he stated this project will allow Whistle Pig to reduce their CO2 emissions and their dependence on non-sustainable energy. On to bourbon release news. Distillery 291 has two new tasting room releases that are happening for Father's Day. 291 Colorado Straight Whiskey and their 291 Colorado Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Aged for three years and bottled at cash strength, these limited edition offerings are the oldest whiskeys 291 has released to date. These can be purchased online at distillery291.com for an SRP of around $200 each. Kentucky Al Dry State is set to release soon. It's a very small blend that has been created by Dixon Deadman, and only 2,000 bottles will be available globally in the market. It's a blend creating 12, 15, and 16 year old whiskeys and bottled at 100 proof. It will come in some extravagant packaging, but it's also gonna carry a price tag of $1,000. Now for today's podcast, Freddie Johnson, he is bourbon. You're gonna hear that among many other praises from one of the most well-respected people in the industry. He's never short on stories and he makes any experience together a memorable one. Of course, Freddie talks about tours and his impact he's had on Buffalo Trace. But then there's also a few topics he discusses, such as bottle flipping and the secondary market. It's great insight into how Sazerac is approaching this issue amongst enthusiasts. And I gotta say thank you also to the Kentucky Derby Museum for letting us capture the Legend series. Make sure you attend next season's events by following the Kentucky Derby Museum on social media channels. And have you ever wanted to get barrel bourbon shipped right to your door? Well, now you can. You can get access to their award-winning products right now online. Go to BarrelBourbon.com and click the Buy Now button. Thank you to everyone that has taken a moment and left us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podchasers, and everywhere in between. It really helps go a long way in growing the show. So if you can, take a minute or two and please write us a review. With that, enjoy today's episode, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. 
I've said on this show many times that Mark Brown, the CEO of Buffalo Trace, is one of the smartest, most intelligent, forward-thinking businessmen in all of spirits. That man is playing chess when most of the rest of the industry is playing checkers. This past week, Sazerac announced that it acquired Early Times, Collingwood, and Canadian Miss, as well as the whiskey stocks associated with those brands and that Collingwood Distillery in Ontario. I want to tell you how big of a move this is. One, Brown Foreman is shedding off some things that may not be making it money. And they're also in a time when they need cash. You see, no company has been hurt more by the international tariffs on whiskey than Brown Foreman. Jack Daniels, they have announced, has lost $125 million, you know, over every, you know, financial cycle. They're just hemorrhaging money from, from those particular tariffs. And then you throw in the pandemic and everything else that's going on in the world. And they were hurting. Not necessarily hurting like they're about to go bankrupt or anything like that, but they needed to make some moves that made sense for them. Now, what this does, in my opinion, as I stated on my YouTube channel in a quick hot take, is that it opens up Brown Foreman to get back into the contract distilling space. See, by not having that still time for early times, which maybe might have taken 15 to 20 percent of that Shively uh, distillery's time, if that, they will now be able to sell that still time to someone else, someone who wants to get into contract distilling. So this is a great move for Brown Foreman to get back into the kind of like trade, the wholesale world of, of American whiskey and to sell some still time in the trade world. For Sazerac, well, they get another brand and everyone wants to focus on early times. But folks, they got a juggernaut of a distillery in Ontario. And as Canadian whiskey is rising and the trends are pointing toward that being possibly the next whiskey boom, they are set in assets in Canadian whiskey. And they've done a really good job with Garibou Crossing. And I, I, if they can convert uh, Canadian whiskey as they did American whiskey, watch out, world. There's going to be a whole lot of uh, single barrel Canadian whiskeys on the market, some small batch Canadian whiskeys on the market. I don't think you'll see a lot of blends that uh, are Canadians... Canadians are historic for coming out of Sazerac, and there probably going to be some, but I think they're going to Americanize a lot of those Canadian whiskeys, and the Canadians are great distillers. I can't wait to see what they're going to do with those distillers. So while everyone's focusing on early times, I see the big move for Sazerac being the Canadian distilleries. With all of that said, we are in, in an economic downturn. And anytime you start seeing these kinds of moves happen in, in down economies, you kind of wonder what is next. Well, historically, we'll start seeing some of the smaller brands get gobbled up by larger parent companies. So don't be surprised if you see, um, you know, little bitty distilleries get purchased here and there by the conglomerates. But make no doubt about it. This was a historic move for both sides, and there are more to come for sure. As someone who writes bourbon history, I'm kind of like trying to figure out what's going to be next. And if I'm going to put my money on something, if I'm going to say what's going to be the next major acquisition in this world, I would put all my eyes on Four Roses. I'm just saying, if I'm in the acquiring mood right now, and... I'm trying to get a hot brand. I would be putting all my chips toward Four Roses because you can't get, I don't think there are many, many American whiskeys uh, that have that kind of quality sitting in the warehouses and the brand recognition in such a short amount of time of being back in the United States. So if somebody wants to loan me a billion dollars, I'll be happy to go chase them. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, make sure you're checking out my YouTube channel. I've got a lot of cool things coming out, including my quarterly American Whiskeys of the Year so far. Until next week, cheers. My name is Fred Minnick. I've been the Bourbon Authority here for the Kentucky Derby Museum for eight years. And 
The Legend series is something that is very near and dear to my heart. It's very important to me, and it's where we get the most iconic figures of the bourbon industry up here, and we talk to them. Now, eight years ago, nobody was really uh, doing this. Now, everybody's doing it, and people see the see the personalities on the stage, and, and a, thank goodness, on a, on a very regular basis. And a little bit before that time, my wife and I, my beautiful wife right here, here in the front row, um, <laughs> she's like, shut up. Yeah. We went on a tour. I think this was in 2008 or 2009. I had uh, opportunity. They, Buffalo Trace invited me out for something. And this gentleman meets me in the, um, meets me in the visitor center and tells me the story about his grandfather and his father, and he takes us on this journey. And I've been on a lot of bourbon tours. They were all, you know, kind of similar, a little bit of history, sprinkled in with a little bit of science. And then came this passion, this personal story. And one of the things I'll never forget is he points at a brick, and he's like, and this is how they used to, like, mortar the brick. There's some horse hair right here. And I don't know why, but that was one of the things that stuck out to me. And for Jacqueline, it was just the sheer presence of the gentleman to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, the very first tour guide to be elected into the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame, for good reason, the star of the film, neat tour guide at Buffalo Trace Distillery, my good friend, Freddie Johnson. I don't, I don't know. I looked to my right when you said that because there must have been somebody else up on the stage. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I would say you mean, you mean a lot to people in the bourbon industry, in the bourbon community. To many, you are a bourbon because you carry that passion with you every where you go. And it doesn't matter if you are a fledgling little, you know, 12-year-old on a group tour, or if you're someone uh, who's asked you to walk them down the aisle. You care about people. You heard about that. Yeah? So, what he's really telling you is I drive people to drink. (laughs) (laughs) Um... This evening, we've got some folks here that uh, I've got some emotional connections to, and it's really kind of nice that they came out. Um, I mean, I just look around the room, and uh, it was one I was just talking to about about his wife and some things that happened. Um, let me say it this way. I want to set the stage by, I want you to think about you being here right now, And I want you to think about the last good bottle of bourbon that you brought out. And I want you to think about that moment. And what will become apparent to you is, if you think back, you only bring out your good stuff with people that you like. And if I don't like you, I won't even tell you I got it, because I don't want to give you any of it. Now, Freddie, you brought out White Dog for us to taste on the first course here. What, what, What do you... What are you saying to us here? I'm culling them out. I'm culling them out, Fred. (laughs) I mean, because it's not even bourbon yet. And we're going to go on a journey. We're going to have a fun journey because the second piece of that is, no matter how much I like you, when you brought out that good bottle with your friends, if you're in a hurry, as much as you want to bring it out, you still won't bring it out. You only bring it out when you're about to sit down and spend quality time, like we're doing this evening, with folks you enjoy being around. And it's something my father shared with me. It was one of the last bottles we drank together. And he said, Freddie, always remember, there will always be old bottles and barrels of bourbon. He said, they've been around since the 1700s. He said, but when you look at us sitting here together this evening, he says, we're the fragile piece of this whole thing because we're not going to always be around together. And if you are blessed enough to have a good bottle 
and you think enough of the people you're with to bring it out, he said, don't worry about how they drink it. Make a memory. Because a memory will last a whole lot longer than that bottle of whiskey. So with that, you ready to rock and roll? Well, I'll let, I'll let you get through this white dog here because I'm still not convinced you want us around and since you brought it. It's to, uh, it's to cut the wheat from the chaff. All right, here we go. All right. So now let's think about this. It all starts as whiskey coming off the steel. And everybody knows the difference between bourbon and whiskey is the proof off the steel. So believe it or not, you hear about when we have bourbon aged in a glass and Fred tells you to swirl it around and you hold it up to the light and you look at the ambiance and how it cascades down the side of the glass. But very few people realize in its infancy, white dog, you can make legs with white dog just like you do with bourbon and just like you do with wine. So I offer to you to take the glass, bring it up, swirl it around, hold it up to the light, and you'll notice it's actually coating the inside of the glass, and I'm sitting here watching it, and it is so thick that you can hardly see it until you leave it, do it a couple of times, and just hold it up, and all of a sudden you'll notice it's starting to break, and now you can, be seeing it, you can begin to see the legs coming down very, very slow, almost like a cognac, so if we were up by the still at, uh, at the distillery, if you go to a still and somebody gives you some uh, white dog coming off the, off, the, uh, off the well, if they go into the well and pull it out for you, you, when they go into that box and do that, you can actually play with it. It's called waking the dog. All right? So that's where I take it and I slap it and I rub my hands together and you smell of it. But I'm going to show you something else you can do. Now, remember, this bourbon is going to make, this white dog, Mash Bill 1, is going to make E.H. Taylor. It's going to make Benchmark. It's going to make George T. Stagg. It's going to make, uh, let's see, what, the Eagle Rare. It's going to make uh, Stagg Antique, uh, Old Charter. Joshua, if I left any out, I think we pretty much. And, of course, Buffalo Trace, okay? That's an interesting one to forget, though, Freddie. I know, but I'm old. <laughs> I meet a lot of people for the first time a hundred times. Now, watch this. I'm going to show you something kind of cool. Now, if you nose it, it's very soft to the nose. It's very soft and buttery to the nose. And they'll tell you something a lot of times. A little funny thing you can do is, you know, a lot of times they'll tell you to open up your mouth when you know something. And that air coming in with it kind of opens it up a little bit, and you'll pick up a little bit of corn. Now, I'm going to show you something kind of cool. This is crazy. Somebody gives you something new for the first time you're not familiar with, you're not going to drink it. All I want you to do with this is take this white dog and bump it up against your lips. Just splash it up against your lips. You will instinctively stick out your tongue and taste it. And you'll notice something. It made your lips tingle a little bit. But if you'll also notice, your lips feel very buttery. It's just a little oily coating, and that's what's making the legs. That's what's coating the inside of the glass. And you notice it made a little bit of a ting on the tip of your tongue. And that tells you it's a higher proof. But I'm going to show you something kind of cool. This is 125 proof, but we're about to open this up. And when we do this, the viscosity and the taste will blow your mind. So what I want you to do is open up your bottle. Everybody should have a bottle of water. And what you're going to do for me is I want you to take a sip of water, hold the water in your mouth, and with the water in your mouth, I want you to take a swig of this white dog with the water in your mouth and roll it around on your tongue, and you'll notice something amazing. Whoosh. You can feel it coating the inside of your mouth, and all of a sudden you realize, whoa, corn all over the inside of my mouth. And you can feel the viscosity, you can feel how it coats the inside of your mouth, but that's all you've got. You've got corn, you've got a lot of coating, and now your mouth is watering, and it's very one-dimensional. So that's what comes off the steel. And that's what goes into the barrel. And the beauty of bourbon coming off the steel at a lower proof is you retain all the natural properties of the grain, and inherent in the corn and grain are oils and fatty acids. And that's what you're tasting, and that's what's coating your mouth right now. Mm -hmm. 
What do you think? Before it goes into the barrel. It's yummy. Yeah. So everyone here has a pretty good feel. Uh, everyone knows uh, Freddie's story. Who's been on a tour with Freddie? Who has seen the film Neat? Or read the magazine article in Bourbon Plus on the cover story? Well, there's more of these out here where you can read about it, but Freddie's journey is fascinating because his grandfather was part of the distillery, his father was a part of the distillery, and he made a promise to his, his uh, father that he would come back. And I think that's, that's out there. You can find that. But I, what the, 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 world, the world knows you for that story, but I want to get to know you in a different capacity tonight. And uh, you kind of said at the top, you're like, oh, I never know what Fred's going to ask the, me. You know those numbers at the bottom of that picture yeah. was really my address code, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> so when you are, you are now, let, let's talk about a tour that you would get in 2008 and 2009 in comparison today. What was going through your head, you know, 12 years ago, 10, 12 years ago when you were doing tours? Twelve years ago, it was just promises made, promises kept. Um, I'd promised Dad that I would uh, try to work at the distillery during my lifetime. Uh, I'd promised him that I would be his caregiver, and I didn't understand my promise. Uh, I didn't understand caregiving, and I didn't understand chemo. So when I first started, um, I was kind of like doing something not as a passion, but as a promise. Um, my dad the promise to your father. Yes. That you would the, tell the story about how he he made you promise or you made that when you made that promise. Tell everybody the story. Me. He tricked me. <laughs> so if you think about the sixties um, to the nineties, bourbon was no big deal. The warehouses at all these old distilleries were full. Whiskey wasn't moving. They were shutting down. They were laying people off. Only 50 people left at Buffalo Chase. And um, my dad was disappointed. He was hurt because he, I'd already told him that I would like to work at the distillery. He and granddad had assumed that I would be the next generation to work there. Bourbon industry goes dead. I said, well, dad, I said, I found another job. He was happy. <laughs> he realized that he could charge me rent to live at home. So anyway, uh, and so what happened was um, he said, well, I'm sorry that you didn't get to work at the distillery. He said, but if you get a chance during your lifetime, he said, uh, while I'm around, would you come work at the distillery for just a little while? And I'm like, well, sure, Dad. And he said, I get back to Frankfurt. I said, oh, I'll be glad to work there. Well, he's like, you know how you go fishing and you get a bite and then you set the hook? Well, he set the hook. He says, well, since you're going to be coming back, he says, if anything ever happens to me, uh, would you be my caregiver? And I'm like, well, sure, Dad. I, I'll be your caregiver. I'll take care of you. Now he's bringing me in. He says, um, but I do have a couple of stipulations. And I was like, yeah, Dad, because I'm thinking I'll just pack him up and wherever I'm living at, just I'll move Dad with me and we'll be fine. He said, uh, first stipulation is, he said, um, I want to continue to sleep in my own bed. I said, well, hell, that's no big deal. Pack up the bed. And move the bed. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an easy request. And then he said, uh, and I want to keep going to the church that I've gone to all my life. And that's when I realized very subtly he was asking me to come home in a nice way. So history and events are amazing. When I share this with you, it blows my mind. I come back to take care of my dad. He's happy that I'm back. We do a toast every evening. One day we're out on the farm. A guy comes by in a pickup truck and he says, Freddie, he said, have you seen what's going on in New York? And I said, no, what's going on? He said, um, he said, man, it's really bad. And I said, what? He said, planes are flying into the World Trade Center. And my dad looked at me, and I looked at him. My dad hugged me. Why is this important? 
is because part of my assignment put me in New York, and I would ride from New Jersey to New York. It's called the Path from Hoboken into New York, and that's where you get on the subway. And at the time this was going on, I would have been underneath the World Trade Center when the planes hit the World Trade Center. But because I took early retirement and came back home, I missed all of that. And I sit on this stage today with you because of a promise. Wow. How crazy is that? That is something. So now today, when I look at then, the question that you asked, when I look at then, when I first came back, it changed my life. And so today, when I give tours, it's not just a tour. I tell people, look beyond the obvious. Look beyond the obvious. Because we touch lives every day. And we don't realize the significance of what we're doing until later on somebody reminds you of a moment that you spent with them and how it impacted their lives and helped them to do something for someone else. So... When Fred asks me to do things, it's like I don't mind doing them for him because he touched my life, and he did research on my life that I did not know he had done. And um, there are things that I do that I don't normally tell people, and he found out about it. And that's part of what's in the magazine. Um, I just do things because it's the right thing to do, not because you have to do them. Well, and the something about you, too, is that you're, you're not, and I think this is why people, the, the personal side, everybody loves that about you, but you also, like, I've taken, I've probably taken 20 or 30 tours with you, and not a damn one of them are the same. I you told know? you I'm old, I forget. <laughs> <laughs> you, you somehow customize everything to a group where everybody here who's took a tour with you, guarantee none of them got the same sentence. How do you do that? How, what is, what's going through your head when, you, when you're sizing someone up in a room for the first time? What, what's going through your head? How do you know to give them the tour that they need in that moment? It's kind of like you writing, okay? Um, if I did every tour like no one knew anything about bourbon, it would be a very boring tour. But if I present things in a way that are creative, and I try to understand, so when I start my tours, I always ask, how many of you have been to Buffalo Trace before? Just like what Fred was doing here this evening. I also ask, have you been to another distillery before? Then I'll ask, have you been to a brewery? Have you been to a vineyard? Have you been to a winery? And then all of a sudden, you begin to get a, you kind of like get a picture of the cross-section of your group. And what's really cool about what's going on, it's just like this evening, it used to be bourbon was the old folks' drink. And now we look around, I look at the ladies out here this evening, mm -hmm. and you realize that it's a balance. It's a really nice world that we're evolving into, and so you've got to be aware of that. You do it, you do it in creative writing. And so that's what I try to do, is I try to make it so that if you do come and you visit Buffalo Trace, even if you don't get me, you get another tour guide, the objective is to make you feel like your time has been well spent. There are countless stories, okay, of Freddie going up to a person who's in a moment of need. Countless. And he says something to him, And it changes them. One of them was a 12, 14-year-old boy who was, um, the, there, was a, there was a school bus there. In Kentucky, schools will actually take, bring their kids and do bourbon tours because it's agriculture. You know, it's helping the state's economy. When you buy bourbon, you're helping the children of Kentucky. And, and there was this kid who was kind of going off, doing his thing, really trying to like get away from the group and not paying attention to the teacher. And then walked up Freddie. Tell us that story, Freddie. What happened when you saw that child? Um, he reminded me of me. 
So um, if you've ever been around kids that doodle, um, that's what this kid was doing. He was, he was not being standoffish. He was really deliberately trying to be, to not be disruptive. And so I asked him, I said, uh, I said, I just looked at him, I said, are you a doodler? And the teacher that was with him looked at, looked at me and she said, all the time, all the time. So I looked at the, the kid and I said, why do you doodle? He says, I doodle because I'm bored. And he says, I don't want to be disruptive in the class, so I just doodle. He says, because once I've got it, I've got it. But in school, you have to hear the same thing over and over three or four times, and I get bored, so I doodle. And so I showed him some of the equipment. We were in, in Regage at the time that happened, and there's some mechanical equipment in there. And I looked at him, and I said, you know, a doodler made that unit over there that turns those barrels around. I said, it uses zero energy. I said, but it's based on inertia and just the moving of the barrel and the weight of the whiskey in the barrel. And I said, but a doodler did that because that doodler understood the concept of that barrel moving down through there. And he kind of like looked at me. And I said, that's what your teacher's doing for you out here. I said, this is not just a field trip. I said, your teacher's planting seeds. She's showing you the theories that she's teaching you in school. This is how you apply them. And I said, when you doodle, you're doing those things that she has taught you. That's what you're doodling with. That's causing you to design these things the way you are. And the kid looks at me. He looks at the teacher. The teacher looks at him. Two months later, I get the nicest letter, Fred, and it was the teacher saying, we can't thank you enough for what happened. She said, on the bus going back to Indianapolis, they were with the Future Farmers of America, she said, I went back and I talked to the kid, and she said, I tell you what, let's do a deal. She said, when we're in class and you get it, just tell me that you got it. And she says, I won't bug you anymore. She says, but I'm going to ask you to do something for me. I want you to help me. She said, I want you to help me help the kids that don't get it so that we all get it. The reason for the letter was, she said, that kid became from a standoffish person to the most sought after, to the most sought after student in her class. All the kids got it. He was voted the most important member of their class and all because of just a moment of letting him be himself and understanding why he was the way he was. <laughs> Crazy. And again, ladies and gentlemen, this is why Freddie Johnson is on this stage, is because he has this ability and this desire to touch people's lives, these stories he shares, the things he talks about, it's because he cares about people. And it fascinates me how many stories there are just like that. You have touched so many lives, so many lives. And let's go to, let's go to the... some bourbon? Let's go to the Buffalo Trace. I was going to say, let's drink some okay. bourbon now. So here's a fun thing. The white dog. I want you to take the white dog and just nose it for a moment. And then pick up that glass of Buffalo Trace and swirl it around and hold it up to the light. You'll notice something kind of interesting. The coating is a little bit more pronounced. And what you have now is, now you have the contribution of that newly charred oak container. You've got uh, the caramelized sugars from the oak. You've got the saps and rosins that are in the fibers of the wood. And so the nose is entirely different. Same product, but this is about eight years in the barrel, sitting on the middle floors of the warehouse, where it's a combination of the temperature fluctuations in Kentucky, but also a little bit of the barometric pressure, which moves whiskey in and out, but without heat. So it produces a soft nose, but it also, you pick up the enhanced flavors of the oak. If you'll notice, it's, it's amazing how beautiful the color is. I really like these glasses, the way that they show off the color of the bourbon and what's going on with it. And the other thing I like is I like the, uh, the opening is large enough that you can really get your nose down in there. You know? Yeah, I like, this is a really good, this is a good neutral glass. So let's try this. 
Let's try bumping the Buffalo Trace up against your lips, just like you did the white dog. Stuck your tongue out, didn't you? I saw that. <laughs> but did you notice the tingling on the lips was not as pronounced? If you notice, your lips don't feel as buttery because it's been cut down a little bit. The other thing you'll notice is that the tip of the tongue, you, I get a little bit of, I'll get a little bit of punch of the rye. What do you pick yeah, up definitely, on? definitely a little bit of the baking spices there. Uh, I, this is going to sound weird, but I kind of want to eat some country ham now. I, I want a little ham mm. biscuit, a little country ham with this. Am and I some, wrong? And some spicy brown mustard. Ooh! That does sound yeah. good. Oh, it is. Yeah, it is. that does sound good. Now, let's watch this. It's the very same product. Take a sip of water. And with the water in your mouth, take a swig of your buffalo trace and roll it around on your tongue. And watch how it opens it up. You can feel it coating the inside of your mouth. It makes your mouth water. But now you've got the punch of the rye. you got a little bit of oak and char. And when you swallow, what's cool about it is the finish is unbelievably smooth like a good balanced bourbon. So the crazy part is when you're with friends and family, what I try to get folks to understand is if I'm not familiar with the bourbon, I start with a big gulp of water. And I gradually reduce the amount of water that I hold in my mouth. And what I tell people all the time, Fred knows this, is a lot of people, because they instinctively like bourbon, bourbon with a splash of water, they'll get the bourbon and they immediately throw a splash of water in there. The problem with that is if you're not familiar with the product, you've diluted it. And you can never get back to the original taste. That's right. It's almost like putting salt and pepper on your eggs before you taste the egg. Could be a special egg. Maybe you don't want the salt and pepper. Yeah. Or if it's a chef, you're going to get smacked upside the head. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, begin to make sense. So, Harlan Wheatley is pretty cool. Harlan Wheatley, most people don't know it, but all of the master distillers at Buffalo Trace have been engineers. Harlan is a chemical engineer, and uh, Harlan feels like Buffalo Trace is probably, Mashville one that he created, is probably about the most balanced product that he's got because it's a nice middle floor, aged about eight years. And he thinks that somewhere between 8 and 12 is really a good balance for a bourbon. Which I I, I'm a, I'm in a thousand percent agreement on that. 8 and 12 years old is, is a sweet spot for a lot of them. Some of them need to be older, you know, but between 8 and 12 is when, when the sweet action starts happening. Anything after 12 years old, it's on a wood clock, you know. It, it, it could be too much wood come forward. Something you mentioned during this tasting, you, you mentioned family. Family comes up a lot with you in any conversation because you're very passionate about your family. And uh, there's one family that I've noticed of yours that, um, that may not be very well known, and that is your family at Buffalo Trace. I have seen people, when they speak of you, get in tears. Get in tears. Mark Brown, when you came in and rolled out that last barrel, he was crying about that moment, about giving you that opportunity. What does Buffalo, what do the people of Buffalo Trace mean to you? Wow, that's a biggie. I told you not to do that. So, um, if you come to a place like that, um, Joshua's over here. Joshua, to me, blew me away when I, when I was down there. I was signing the bottles, and I looked up, and he walked into the room, and I said, I said, I didn't know you were going to be here this evening. And he says, I just flew in. Uh, where were you, in Canada? California? Kind of the same, though. Yeah, okay. <laughs> only, only about, based on what he's California's telling me earlier. California's a little warmer. But. Yeah, about 40-degree temperature difference or something like that. And, um, and I said, oh, I said, I didn't know that you were going to be here this evening. And uh, he said... He said, well, I heard you were going to be here, and I thought I would just come in and check it out and, and uh, be a part of this. And that is what Fred is talking about, because he didn't have to come in. And it's nice to know that someone thought enough of what we were doing that he would take, take time away from his family 
to come in, even though he's been out of town, to stop by and, and spend some time. So thank you. But that's what we're talking about. Um, there, people help each other around there. Um, it's not a place that you come to work. A lot of the creative things that you see around Buffalo Trace, the paintings, the, uh, the chair wall upstairs, a lot of the creative stuff, the stools and all those things, the mounting of the horses on the barrel stays, those are all creations of the employees. So what has actually happened is Buffalo Trace has become not a place that you come to work, but they have become, the employees have become part of the workplace. And everybody kind of looks, looks after everyone else. And a synergy has developed, and that synergy has caused everybody to get creative. We've got all kinds of experimental bourbons, and uh, all the employees feel like they're a part of that because it's not one piece. Fred told me, this little guy over here shared something with me one time. We were talking about bourbons and whiskeys and all this stuff, and his comment was, it's not the product. It's the piece parts that make the product, and each piece part is important. Yeah. And that's what the family at the Buffalo Trace does, is every person understands their piece is a part of the product. Now, do they give you a good case of Weller at the end of every year? I'm still waiting for that part. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, you have to, you, do you still have, do you have to buy your own Blantons and Weller and... Yeah, a lot of people think that, that uh, we have kind of like a little special incentive program that you get so many bottles, you know, based on what you sell or what you promote and all that. And uh, the answer is no. So we have to, we'll go in and we'll wait in line with everyone else to get a bottle of Blanton's, okay, or a bottle of Eagle Rare, a bottle of E.H. Taylor. Um, we don't get special dibs. Really? No. Talk to Mark about that. I mean, that. like, you could, but you got, you got access to the whiskey thief, though. You know, you could go back there and crack open a barrel. And... Wait, 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 wait. Now, <laughs> let's think about this. Now, you know, that's the legal and the oh, oh, illegal. I'm, right. Okay? Legal. So, yeah. That's now, right. Now, you talked about something. This is critical. 690,000 barrels of whiskey are aging at Buffalo Trace right now. 690,000 barrels. And of those 690,000 barrels, 29,000 of those barrels are the bourbons and whiskeys of tomorrow. Right. Okay? So I'm looking at my age, and so if you do an experiment, good experiment, what runs about maybe 8 to 10 years? Josh gets involved with this a lot of times. So 8 to 10 years for the experiment. They test the barrel. It's a good one. It's, a, it's an E.H. Taylor four mm -hmm. grain. Ah, well, maybe we should make that, okay? Well, then that means that you're going to wait another 8 to 10 years before it becomes a production item. So, these 29,000 barrels that we've been playing with, I'm looking at my age, and I'm thinking, Fred, I'm thinking, damn, I ain't going to make it. <laughs> so, I have decided... I may have to know before I go, so I'll call you up and let you know when I've got that thief going. Well, you know, <laughs> we're friends, so always, you always got my support there. But I, I, would, I do want to say, like, I, I set that up as kind of like a joke, and I realize it actually is it, it's not funny to joke to someone about, like, stealing whiskey from your distillery. That, you, that, you get in trouble for that. That didn't go well, did it? No. No. It, it's, it's, attempt, it's been attempted before, and yeah. people are now serving time. Uh, so now I want to I want to talk about like your favorite part of the tour because I have seen you really really excited in like uh, the ghost part and the in the uh, dry room area in the warehouses and the still house the putting the 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 whiskey on your uh, on your cheeks is kind of like aftershave. Oh the question for me, from me to you is like, what is your favorite part, your absolute favorite personal part of a Buffalo Trace tour? There are more craft distilleries popping up around the country now more than ever before. So how do you find the best stories and the best flavors? Well, Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month Club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse's box ship out every two months to 39 states across the U.S. 
In Rackhouse's April Box, they're featuring a distillery that mixes Seattle craft, Texas heritage, and Scottish know-how. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is shipping out two whiskeys from Two Bar Spirits located near downtown Seattle, including their straight bourbon. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try some for yourself. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. What is your favorite part, your absolute favorite personal part of a Buffalo Trace tour? Um, my favorite part, actually, believe it or not, is going through the warehouses. Um, and the reason is, is that if we have time on a tour, I like to take folks through different parts of different warehouses, not just take them in and bring them back out again. And I allow them to use their senses. I mean, it's amazing when you go into some of these buildings, they feel different, they smell different, and you can go from one area to another area and the climate changes completely. And when you do that, that's when I get excited because once they realize that, and if I get a chance, like if I'm doing a behind the scenes tour, I may take you up on another floor, I'll take you up on the elevator, and I let you see how just going from one level to another level, how dramatic the change is. And all of a sudden they get it. And that's what's important is they look beyond the whiskey in the bottle and they realize all these other things the settlers did in the 17 and 1800s, and they figured out where to put those barrels in those warehouses. That's why I get excited. So as we go into this taste of Weller, I want everyone to pull out their phones, if you get a second. Everyone familiar with IMBD? IMBD, that's like where we go to track celebrities now. <laughs> you're, uh, you're a celebrity to be tracked on IMBD. Did you know that? Yes, sir. You are in the top, like, 200,000 of, uh, of, like, uh, people on the silver screen. Did you ever imagine that? I did not realize this. But here's how, <laughs> what happens. I'm at a Lego convention with my grandson, and we're looking at Lego displays, and all of a sudden these folks come running up and saying, Oh! It's him. It's him. It's the guy from Buffalo Trace. Can we take a picture? Come over here. And my grandson says, Papa, this is not any good. <laughs> he says, can't we go anywhere? And so now I take him to the movies and we go in and we zip right on in and get into our chairs and <laughs> sit down and have popcorn. Um, I did not. And it's very, very humbling. It's... Uh, I, I only wish that my dad and my granddad, um, not about Freddie, but for my dad and my granddad to see the distillery that they took care of those barrels at that are now the products that basically some of the last barrels that Elmer and dad handled at Buffalo Trace, those are the ones winning all the awards now. Yeah. And, at, you know, it's kind of like driving down here, uh, Fred had mentioned about legacies and things like that, uh, a part of what he wanted to talk about. And I thought about that, and I said, you know, I'm a third generation, but if you think of a distillery like a dog, they say, what, one year for an adult is seven years for a dog? And we talk about second and third generation folks. Well, a good generation of bourbon, based on what we were just talking about, about, you know, about somewhere 8 to 12 years, so we'd average out at 10. So a legacy for me would be one generation to the next. Okay, so there's like 20 years between my dad and me. So that would be the equivalent of 40 to 60 years in expressions of bourbon, if you just did it that way. So that would be like three... 10-year increments. And if you think about 30 years in the industry and all the bourbons that have been created that you get, a, you taste over, what, 3,000 bourbons? I ta probably? Yeah, I taste a lot. Yeah, yeah I taste a lot. <laughs> and so you begin to look at that, and you look at the number of expressions of bourbon that have just come out in the last 30 years. And those are basically 
legacies. Those That's are, right. So, well, Freddie, I have no doubt that your grandfather and your father are looking down at you right now, and they're thinking to themselves, "Why haven't you picked up the Weller yet and started talking about it?" I noticed your yours is a little bit lighter than mine. Well, I don't, I don't know what happened here. I think I got a light pour. Yeah, actually, there's a hole in the glass here at the bottom. Here, I, can, I, can see the, I can see it dripping. So, all right, so now let's see. A lot of people say, well, can you tell the difference in bourbons just by nosing them? Well, check it out. Get your Buffalo Trace in one hand. Get your Weller Antique in the other. And the Weller Antique is 107 proof. It's also seven years old. It's about seven to eight years old. Okay. The nose is entirely different. What I like is if you look at the color, okay, the color is pretty close to the same. And the reason for that is, is that it's a higher proof, so it hasn't been cut as much. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Cling, cling, cling. Now they're cheating. They're not waiting for you to talk about the nose. Well, they already know. To, they've already. I, oh, you went to sipping already, already. Yeah, okay. I've already, yeah they, I've already done the nose thing. I saw, but if you bump it, you'll notice that your lips tingle a little bit more. And you stick out your tongue a little bit more, a little bit more bite on the tongue. It shows you how sensitive the, the, the mouth and the tongue actually are. And all you did was you went from 90 proof to 107 proof. And different, and different recipes, too. Yes. Yeah. And normally, you know, I tell people all the time, rye is robust, while wheat is sweet. So now oh, do let's... Do that one more time. Yeah. <laughs> do, rye is, do the rye is robust. Yeah, rye is robust, <laughs> and wheat is sweet. I love right. it. Cool. Now, let's watch this. Watch what happens this time. Take a sip of water. Hold the water in your mouth. Now, take your swig of the Weller and watch how it opens up and explodes. I mean, we were talking about, I was talking to Jackie earlier about favorites, and we were like, yeah, we're there. <laughs> so the Weller, boosh, it's all over the inside of your mouth. Did you notice the mouthfeel, the viscosity is entirely different? The reason, even though it's 107 proof here, it comes off the still at a much lower proof. And it goes into the barrel at a lower proof. And the beauty of doing that is the lower the proof off the still, the more you retain those natural properties that you felt when you first tasted the white dog. A lot of those oils and fatty acids are still in there. They haven't been distilled out. And it becomes part of the taste profile. And the human body can detect that viscosity. It can detect that. And it makes your mouth water more. I like it. It's quite yummy. Now, here's the thing. You know, once upon a time, we could go into the liquor store and find this bottle just sitting there for $25, maybe $19.99. Oh, oh who's going to pay $25 for a <laughs> bottle of bourbon? The good old days. <laughs> now you do a Google on this thing, and it's... 200 bucks somewhere, and some places will be as ridiculous as, like, a 1,000. I hate to say it, but they're out there. And even tonight, like, the, the bottle, when someone gets an opportunity to buy it, the, the Weller Full Proof, very delicious, by the way. You know, it's your latest release. I mean, it's selling, on average, five, 600 bucks. Yeah. Amy was telling me that we were talking about this coming in, and Amy said $800. She can go out there, and you put it up online, and there are places they're selling it for $800 a bottle. Wow. So how do you feel like you're, 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 you're kind of, uh, really, you're the face of Buffalo Trace right now in a lot of ways. How do you feel about seeing these prices go haywire, far above the suggested retail price from Buffalo Trace? If you talk to anyone at Buffalo Trace, not just me, um, we are not happy about that because people talk about how much they had to pay for a bottle. And then the other piece of that is, what's even worse is, like, I was doing a tour. We came back in off the tour, and upstairs, as you know, we've got the Pappies and the George T. Staggs and all those up there. And Your this, office. It's your office, right? God, that's the other room. We don't talk about that. But <laughs> so we're up, at, we're up there doing a the tasting, and this guy basically in front of everybody, he says, I've got four of those. I've got five of those. And I'm looking at him, and uh, 
He said, I got a bottle that that uh, 23 year old pappy paid seven thousand dollars for it. And I looked at him, I said, oh, really? And he says, I was so disappointed. And everybody in my group looks at this guy and I said, I beg your pardon. He said, it just didn't live up to my expectations. He said, it was just not what I expected. So you get these things, all right? And you've done tastings with people that have told you stuff like that. And I looked at this guy and I said, sir, I said, now I don't mean to be disrespectful. You have to understand, you can drop a letter to Mark Brown at 2 o'clock in the morning and he'll respond to your, your at email. At 2.05, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, oh, she's, I mean, because everybody's looking at this guy. And I said, sir, I said, I don't really mean to be disrespectful. I said, but have you ever purchased a new car? This guy looks at me like, look, little twerp. <laughs> I already told you I paid $7,000 for this bottle of bourbon. Obviously, I've got enough money to buy a new car. And I said, sir, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I said, all I'm asking is, did you just go into a dealership with your checkbook and write out a check for a car that you've never even driven and pick up the keys and go out and start it up and drive it off for the first time? I said, or did you take it for a test drive? And this guy looks at me like, <laughs> I said, sir, before I tell everyone, and it's not just about Buffalo Trace Fred. There's a lot of expensive bourbons out there, as you well know, that the prices are being jacked up on. I tell people all the time, before you spend any amount of money on a good bottle of bourbon, get with a couple of people that you enjoy being with, go out to a nice restaurant or bar and get a flight and get three or four of these bourbons that you've heard a lot about, pool your money and just sit there and taste them. And I said, and sometimes you're going to find that the bourbon that you were about to spend $7,000 for, you like one for $50 better. And so then you feel like you've got a good deal for your money. Does that happen a lot? Do people challenge you a lot on tours like that? Yeah. It's an interesting mix. We, uh, right now, um, we've already had, I was listening to the number that, that Pat had mentioned uh, for uh, Churchill Downs, and we just had uh, a rollout, and we found out in the, that in the last, what, fiscal year now, we've had over 290,000, we're pushing 300,000 people at Buffalo Trace just within the last 12 months, and that's during the winter period. How many visitors here? How many went multiple times? Yeah, those are our people. But first, I want to get back to like these disgruntled like uh, visitors you got here. What, how are you dealing with them? So the latest thing that we have now is we are under allocation like all the retail stores. And um, when people find out that we've got the E.H. Taylor, the Eagle Rare, or the Blantons, um, they, they call in advance to find out when the allocation is coming in. And so of late, uh, they will start arriving at 6 o'clock in the morning with little tailgate chairs. And by the time the doors open at 9 o'clock, we've got a line of 300 people out in front of the gift shop. And they all come in at the same time. The visitors come in to take tours that are coming from all over the country, just like Fred was asking about the visitors coming in tonight. And most of you are not from... Louisville proper, you're from areas outside of Louisville, and you took the time to come here. So the view is, it would be nice to have some for you. But these folks are in there, they're upset. Now there's not enough bourbon, there's not enough Blantons. They came in, and they send out broadcast codes. And they, one, they, they have like, what, like yeah. old ham radio broadcast codes? or the, the, On the phones. Pretty much, might as well be a ham radio. And, and what they do is they say, it's in. And when that message goes out, these folks, most of them are within a 50-mile radius of the distillery, will come in. They're only allowed one bottle per person, and they'll bring three or four friends. Wow. And they'll bring them in, and, they, and then what they'll do is they keep one for themselves, and they flip them. And that's where the $200 bottles and $300 bottles of Blantons and stuff are coming from. Um, and so they're coming up with a plan. It's getting ready to be announced. They're going to they're gonna try something. And some of the distilleries that you take tours at limit right. 
uh, and they have a period of time before you can get another bottle of their exclusive mm -hmm. products. And uh, they're, they're talking about basically implementing something like that just so that the visitors that are coming from other places can experience the joy of getting something unique uh, while they're at Buffalo Trace. Now, I know this is like not your area or anything, but you, you, you may have an opinion on I don't know, but that, that flipping part that you mentioned, what, what do you think about that, people who buy the bottles and then try to resell them? Some of them were, my friends. Oh, wow. Um, and it, it's, not a, it's not a comfortable feeling because a lot of people think that we are supplying them with those bottles to flip. Um, but uh, we had to sign an agreement that we, and Josh is here so he can attest to what I'm talking about, that we are not allowed to purchase and resell bottles if we are blessed enough to get one, when we do get ours, um, if they find out that we're flipping those, we are subject to disciplinary action. They don't want us even entertaining that kind of st stuff to make people think that we're trying to profit and abuse the opportunity to get a bottle like everyone else. So it's, yeah, they're very, very serious about that. It's unfortunate because we're the ones caught in the middle of that, and a yeah. lot of people think we're hoarding it, but the product that we're selling was made 10, 20 years ago. And bourbon was no big deal. So don't be mad at us. You're the one sucking it up. <laughs> we, as Harlan says, if it wasn't enough, it's not enough. You know who I feel bad for at Buffalo Trace? Those poor people on the Blanton's bottling line who are there every single day putting stickers and bottling Blanton's, and people are like, I can't get Blanton's, but here's Blanton's right here. They hear that every day. I'll blow your mind with this one. Do you know they run two shifts, and their, their number that they roll out each day for these two shifts is 7,000 bottles a day leave Blanton's bottling hall. 7,000 bottles a day, and it's still not enough. It's funny because we joke about this all the time, like, it can't get blends, but they're bottling it every day, you know. So, uh, yeah, so we get some folks that uh, they get mad because they go down there, they see the blends being bottled, and they want to know why they, we can't just bring it over to the gift shop and give them a taste of it or sell it to them, and they don't realize it's against the law. So it has to go through a distribution center. Yeah, the, the whole uh, alcohol law thing, boy, it gets in the way of a lot of stuff. But you know what it's not going to get in the way of is tasting the Sazerac rye. Yes. <laughs> we are heading in the right direction. Let's do it. Let's, let's okay. taste this rye. So good old Sazerac rye. Most people knew about the Sazerac 18. Uh, well, no, that's not really true. Very few people knew about the Sazerac 18 because that was the antique collection. It only came out once a year. But it's always been one of the top three whiskeys in the world. Year after year after year after year, okay? So, this is six-year-old Sazerac rye. It is 90 proof. But here's the, here's the deal. If you nose this one, you'll notice something. The nose is entirely different. And for me, it always reminds me of dill. I always get dill. I don't know where that... Yeah. Def definitely dill. I mean, black licorice here. This is, this is a kind of a... Um, this is a throwback, throwback rye in some ways, as, as I like to say it. Now, you ready for this? Uh-oh, he's already there. He's lip bumping already. Well, <laughs> my, my wife Jacqueline started drinking before we started even talking about it, so, you know. So, so let's give this one a go. So let's bump this one up against your lips. Now, did you notice the tingling was not as pronounced as the other? So you just went from 107 proof down to 90 proof. So that shows you just how sensitive your lips are, and you can detect changes in proof just by doing that. And one of the beautiful things about this tasting, too, is that you're getting a, a fun opportunity to taste how grains can change, how, how grains can influence the flavor of, of a product, the Buffalo Trace, the Weller, and the Sazerac, they're all within that same age range, and they're all, you know, 107 proof is, is, is a little higher, but they're all, they're not that far off from proof. So you can taste all three of these 
and see how a grain can change the flavor. And that I, I really like how you selected this fly. I'm curious how you, because I leave it up to our, uh, our guests of honor to choose what whiskeys they want to taste. How did you choose these? How, what, was in, what was in your mind? Um, a lot of people have never put the three different recipes together. Uh, I was surprised that when I do a lot of the tours, I'll ask uh, folks about differences in recipes. When you get back home, you want to have some fun, sit down with some friends, bring out a bottle or two, pour a drink, and as they're about to sip it, get them to stop and ask them the grains in the recipe. And what will blow your mind is most of the people that you drink with don't even know the grains and the products they consume. Usually they just stumble upon something that they like. Yeah. So this gives you a chance to see the three different recipes, a rye recipe bourbon, a wheat recipe bourbon, and a straight rye whiskey. And you get a chance to see, well, there really is a difference in the nose, and there really is a difference in the taste. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, here we've had an incredible honor here to, um, to, to honor somebody who's near and dear to my heart, and I hope to yours tonight after uh, you've got to know Freddie a little bit. I want to take the opportunity and uh, open it up for, uh, for questions in the audience. Freddie, the question was, what's the best bourbon, the most special bottle, the most special time that you shared with that drink? What was that time and, and what was that, that drink that you shared? So if you get a chance to watch the video, the documentary Neat, it was a bottle of 20-year-old Pappy. Uh, it was one of the original bottles that Julian Van Winkle, I found out later on, actually had put the labels on over in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. Um, had the wax cap on it. And when Dad rolled out the six millionth barrel, uh, no one had expected him to live that long. He was dying of cancer. And um, he said, Freddie says, um, I'm giving you this to share with your dad. I did not know that my dad was the one that handled a lot of the Van Winkle barrels when they came there because they're very old and a lot of them came out of uh, uh, the Weller plant down in uh, Louisville, over here in Louisville. And um, he said, but just promise me, he said, promise me that you'll share it, that you'll you know, you share this with your dad. And I'm thinking, damn, this is a really good bottle of bourbon here. Do I flip? I do. <laughs> no, you didn't say that. Uh, so what happened to me was this. It's my dad my brother and I. And what had happened was my brother found out that I had taken early retirement to come home to take care of my dad. He found out that he was also terminally ill. His cancer was more aggressive than my dad's. And he called me up and he says, hey, he says, can I come home and will you take care of me also? So I don't even talk about a lot of this stuff. Um, so what happened was um, it got to the point that um, my dad was in one bedroom, my brother was in the other bedroom, and I was in the bedroom in the middle. And basically, I would take care of them. And then when I, dad did not want me to not go to Buffalo Trace. He says, I don't care. I want you to go to work every day. So I got hospice to help me. So that's why I do stuff with hospice. And so <sighs> we get this bottle, and I'm telling dad how special it is and all that. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, you know, come on, get on with the damn poor. You know, I know it's a, I know it's a good bottle. <laughs> and so here's what happens to me. So I pour a little bit in my dad's glass, a little bit in my brother's glass, pour some in my glass, and I go to put the stopper. Now, I want you to think about what I'm about to say. And I go to put the stopper back in the bottle. And my dad looks at me and he says, what on earth are you doing? I said, Dad, this is a really good bottle of bourbon. He said, Freddie, I'm fully aware of that. <laughs> and I said, I said, well, Dad, I said, we're doing a toast. He said, I'm aware of what we're doing. I'm asking what you're doing. I said, well, Dad, I'm trying to save it so we can do some more toast later on. He looked at me and said, Freddie, your father is 94 years old. I don't have a lot of toasting left in me. He said, promise me, promise me you'll never do that again. And I looked at him. I had no earthly idea of what he was talking about. 
And he says, remember why you bring it out. He said, there's always going to be more bourbon, but friends and family won't always be around. And what we do when we have a good bottle of wine, what do you do? You pour everybody a drink. You put the cork beside the bottle to allow the wine to continue to breathe in the bottle while you're drinking. But what do you do with your good stuff? That good bottle of bourbon. You bring it out. You pour everybody a drink. You put that cork back in that bottle. And you set it back out of the way like one and done. One and done. All right. And so he said, that's when he said, he said, don't do that. When you bring out that good bottle, you're with friends and family. You ever <laughs> look at <laughs> Think about it. You start sipping bourbon, time, become, time is not even a factor. Two or three hours will go by. Put the cork to the side, and it tells your friends, I'm not worried about the whiskey because I'm enjoying the moment. Why don't I have another drink? Have another drink. The, the significance of that question, it was the first time my brother, my father, and I had ever spent three hours together, just us. Wow. No radio, no TV, Fred, no nothing. Just us laughing and talking and recapturing our lives. And the irony of it all, nine months later, they were both gone. And if I had not done that, the bottle would have still been there. But every time I looked at that, I would have remembered that I could have shared it with them. And I didn't. So I stopped saving my bourbons. What I do now is if I think enough of someone and I bring it out, whoever drinks from that bottle with me, we sign and date the bottle. So that's why I carry those pins around with me all the time is because people will come up out of nowhere and they say, Freddie, I got this really cool bottle of bourbon. I would love to do a taste of it with you. And we sign the bottle and I date it. So I've got a timeline of special friends and um, folks that I've had a good drink with. I've got a timeline of who it was and who drank from the bottle with me. End of that story. Hope that answers it. But well, thank you. thank you for asking that question that led to the beautiful answer. Thank you for that. I, I now want to, I know you all have been hitting these glasses pretty hard, but if you have a little bit left, even if you don't, please grab a glass and let's toast a man who has done more for bourbon than in terms of bringing the personality out and letting us understand what bourbon's really about. It's about a moment. And tonight, my friend, is Freddie Johnson's moment. Salute. Cheers. Salute.